This is Dave Smeltz from the Voice of Victory podcast. And here it is, Sunday night. We're looking at Sunday night, January the 8th, 2023. Man, time does fly. I remember looking at the calendar many years ago and seeing 1990, 1995. Then there was the year 2000. And then there was the year 2015. And then 2020. Now here it is, 2023. I met a little man a little while ago. I went out and uh, uh, got us a little supper. I got some, um, boy, that was good to drink. Went out and got us um, a pizza for supper tonight. So I met this man at the pizza shop. We're standing there, we're talking, and uh, he looks at me, and I look at him, and I said, well, how old are you? And he says, well, um, I, I was 77 in September. Well, I said I was 77 in October. Come to find out he was born September 7th, 1945, and I was born October 7th, 1945. So we had a little birthday party. No, <laughs> no we talked and shared with one another. It was good. We enjoyed talking to one another. And that's what it's all about. You meet people. He was a farmer, and uh, he farmed for many, many years. And it was a blessing to talk with him. And... Uh, I, I I I can talk with just about anybody. I just start talking. Next thing you know, we're carrying on a conversation. That's just uh, the way that I am, and I enjoy doing that. I mean, uh, it's it's fun to be able to talk with people and build a conversation, build friendships, and things like that. And uh, I told him that I had been a pastor for many years, and uh, he said, well, you know, that's something. He said I went to church, and he uh, I didn't dwell with him in that because we didn't have a whole lot of time, but. Uh, next time I see him, maybe I will. We'll see how the Lord does that. I hope you've had a good week so thus far, beginning of the year. We have a lot to be thankful for. Well, we can say on Friday night, I believe it was, that uh, the Congress finally made up its mind who was going to be um, the speaker. It took them a little while, but they finally got there. And... Um, you know, when you think about it, I was looking a little while ago in the news, uh, President Biden went down to the border today. Um, he didn't think of where he needed to go. He went every place but where he needed to go. And I expect in the next couple of days he'll come out and talk about uh, what he did down there and all this kind of stuff. And uh, it, it's, it's, it's really bad, folks. I mean, it really is what's going on in the country today and going on in the world. Um, if you notice the news today, Brazil had its January 6th today. The people rebelled and uh, they went into uh, the, uh, the the on, uh, main capital area and they went in and charged into the uh, to the main buildings and uh, they were making their requests known. Interesting. Today, uh, earlier today, I put out a um, little thing on TikTok about... Uh, uh, Ashley Babbitt uh, during January 6th last year. Some interesting things that I had been reading about. Uh, did you know she was the uh, only, actually the only person killed uh, during that whole thing? She was the only one that really was killed. Now, there were people hurt, but she was the only one actually shot, uh, really killed. And so, uh, interesting how that the, me, the media picks up and talks about this and talks about that, and it's not true. Uh, it's so much lying going on, and uh, it really, it really kind of makes you wonder where the country is going at, and uh, and why we're going in that direction. Uh, the churches, um, if you look and see the way things is going on in the church, we're going to talk about this in a little bit, and uh, you see the way churches are going. You know, I brought out the things that I, I thought about today was uh, the Congress, um, the 118th Congress. The second was wokeism. What is wokeism? I, matter of fact, I was talking to someone that even, they hadn't even heard the term before. And then the borders. And then we, we forgot about Afghanistan. You know, you think about Afghanistan, 13 of American soldiers died there. 13. And that uh, not only the 13, but there was a lot of others of Afghanis that died. And then we kind of slipped away about Hunter Biden and President Biden and their financial um, 
uh, just re reeking the finances, reeking the money, getting it in, how they got it in. And then uh, uh, we think about uh, uh, the Ashley Babbitt thing, and we think about the Lieutenant Michael Berg. Uh, Berg. You know, I was uh, reading about what, what he had to say. Here's a man that said he was doing everything that was right. Well, I don't know. I spent some time in the military. I spent some time on, on the SWAT team, uh, not as, as, a, as, a, as a pastor uh, working with the SWAT team. And, you know, he, I was always told, you don't pull your weapon to, unless you're going to shoot it. That man stood there, and if you look at it and watch the film on it, he pulled the gun. He was hiding behind a door, and he stuck his arm. He was so afraid to stand up and go out there and do what he needed to. He was afraid. Now, there was no guns there. There was no gun shooting. But yet he was afraid to stand in front of the people. What a coward he was. Why didn't he come out and then put the gun at him and say, go back out of here? No, he didn't do that. They didn't have guns. There was no guns with them. Ashley Babbitt didn't have a gun. Nobody had a gun except for the police that were there and the people in the Capitol, the Capitol Police. That is what's so interesting about this whole thing. Yet he got away with, uh, with killing that woman, Ashley. I mean, just shot her. Cold-blooded murder. Now that's that's what he did, a cold-blooded murder. Now, if if it had been anybody else, I don't know if they'd got away with it or not. But I mean, he literally, that wasn't questioned. Nothing was ever questioned about how he went about it. He, they just, uh, they said he was following orders. No one gave orders for him to kill anybody. No one did that. But you see, the reality is, is that's what, taking place up in Washington. That's why the other day, last week, you saw 20 holdouts because some of these people are holding out for wanting to get things right and try to get our Congress and get our get Washington square away again. That's what's happening over in Brazil. People, people are getting tired of people making you do stuff. You know, when it comes down to, I didn't know about this matter that took place with the Rules Committee until I started listening to it, that uh, Nancy Pelosi had changed. And I, of course, I wasn't that heavily involved in I've been pastoring for years. But, I mean, uh, that she had changed the rules where she didn't, no one could, no one could question her authority. No one could say anything to her or add, add amendments or do it. She had it set up that way. The friends, that's wrong. That is totally, completely wrong. But that's what happens when you lose leadership. That's what happens when God comes off the scene. And uh, that's what we've seen in, in the last uh, 50 years. And it's got worse and worse and worse. And, uh, and it's not going to get any better. Uh, people think, it, think it's going to, but it's not. Tonight we're going to be talking from Psalm 80 in just a few minutes. And Psalm 80 has much to say about the interesting subject, and that is when God's people need revival. When God's people need revival. We're going to talk about that in just a few minutes. But in the process of that, I want you to keep some people in prayer. Uh, we need to keep our country in prayer. We've got people that are sick. We've got a lot of folks that are, are struggling. The financial situation in our country is making it very, very difficult to they're very difficult for the uh, the young people as well as the elderly. Mostly the elderly are suffering because they don't have enough finances to do uh, to even buy everything that they need for their homes and everything. So we need to be praying for them, and we just need an overall prayer for our people and for the land, and and for the war in Ukraine. And we need to pray about that because I'm fearful. I am really, really fearful that it is going to spread and it's going to get wider and wider. I don't think it's going to end the way people think it's going to end. I think it's going to lead into something much bigger before it's all over with. Because when you look around the world and you see all the conditions and the things that are taking place, you see the revelry and you see everything going on, you almost ask yourself a question, what is going on? I believe, friends, that we are really heading toward the coming of Christ. I don't know when he's coming, no one does, but I, and I've been saying this for years, so it's not something new for me to say it, 
but I really believe we're heading in that direction. It looks, it looks more like it today than it has, at least in my lifetime. Uh, we need to pray for folks that they'll get ready for Jesus to come. Because are you ready? Are you ready for Christ to come? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight. Father, thank you, God, for just being there for us. We love you, Lord. We couldn't do anything without you. You are, you are everything. You're our strength. You are our power. You are our might. You are everything, Lord. And God, help us to keep leaning on you. Help people that are listening tonight that are not saved. If they would just trust you, and let you become their Lord and Savior. And believe in you, God. I pray tonight that they would do that. And I pray for our country. I pray that we would have revival in our country. We need revival. Oh, God, how we need it. And, Lord, I pray tonight that you would give us revival here in America. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When many people hear the word revival, they think of a series of special services with an evangelistic emphasis. By definition, however, revival is something different. It is the reviving of God's people, a renewal of spiritual life and fervor for the Lord. When a believer is genuinely revived, he or she will sincerely repent of sin, rededicate themselves, him or her, either one, to the Lord and strive for holiness and walk more closely with the Lord Jesus Christ than they ever have before. Psalm 80 is a fervent prayer for revival. Shortly after Solomon's death, the nation of Israel divided into two kingdoms. The ten northern tribes banded together and were known as Israel, or the northern kingdom. The southern kingdom, referred to as Judah, was made up of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin. The southern kingdom fell to Babylon in 586 BC, and this was the subject that was found in Psalm 79 and 2 Kings chapter 25. Approximately 135 years earlier, the northern kingdom had been overtaken by the Assyrians. We find that in 2 Kings chapter 17, verses 1 to 23. And here in Psalm 80 was written in response to that tragic event. Psalm 80 answers to what happened to the northern kingdom. The heading for Psalm 80 attributes the psalm to Asaph. Like other psalms bearing his name and that were written years after his death, it was presumably composed by his descendants. The sons of Asaph were an order of temple musicians and they call and they were called by his name in Second Chronicles chapter thirty five fifteen, when the singers of the songs of Asaph were in their place according to the commandments of David, and Asaph and Hermon and Jeduthun and the king Seir and the and the porters waited at every gate they might not depart from the service for their brethren, for the Levites prepared for them. And then also in Ezra chapter 2, verse 41, the singers, the children of Asaph, 120 and 8. We see that they were musicians. The heading also, it termed, the term, Shoshana Idoth, which means the lilies of the covenant. For this was probably the, the title of a popular song, one whose name Asaph chose to go with the lyrics in Psalm 80. Psalm 80 revolves around a refrain or a repeating phrase in which the psalmist pleaded with God to turn his face back toward his people in order to save them from their suffering. Verse 3, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Verse 7, turn us again, O God of hosts, 
and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. And then verse 19. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Throughout the prayer, Asaph addresses the Lord as the God of hosts, the commander of heaven, of heaven's armies, chapter 4. Uh, verse number four, rather. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Once again, verse number seven. Turn us again, O Lord of hosts, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Verse 14. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. And then in verse number 19, turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine and we shall be saved. Now in verse number four, O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayers of thy people? He implies that God had not sent angels to protect the nation when the Assyrians attacked. In the succeeding verses, in which he called God by this name, Asaph was indirectly praying for God to send an angel army to liberate his people from their captors. He realized, however, that before God would deliver his people, they would first have to repent and turn back to him. Therefore, he prayed for God to revive his sinful, rebellious people. He asked God to do a radical work in their heart, a work so powerful that they would never again turn from him. That's what revival does, is when people really get right with God, they, they, they make up their mind, this is the way it's gonna go. Way it's gonna go. Many churches today are really cold, lifeless, and filled with indifferences. Others have accepted or even endorsed sin within their ranks, totally ignoring the doctrines of scriptural separation and holiness. Few souls are saved in these environments. The waters of baptism are seldom stirred, and few individuals are wholeheartedly followers of Jesus Christ. A form of godliness or exist, but the power of God is tragic, tragically missing. Second Timothy chapter three, verse number five says, having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Such churches would do well to adopt this Psalm, Psalm 80, as their own prayer for God to reignite their cold hearts and turn their people back to God. This is when God's people need revival. We find here in Psalm 80, verses 1 to 19. We're going to show you just a few things tonight. One, the appeal to God as your shepherd, the shepherd of his people, verses 1 and 2. To ask God to turn you back to him, verses 3 to 6. Number three, to beg God to restore you, to make his face shine on you and save you, lest ye be condemned. And we're going to see an example of Israel in verses 7 to 16. Number four, ask God to revive you through the Savior, the divinic king, a picture of Christ. This is so important as we look into this matter of revival, wanting revival to come into your church, into your home. Look with me now at verse number one and two. As we began to read the scriptures, let's look at these 19 verses. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that leadest Joseph like a flock, thou that dwellest between the cherubims, and shine forth before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. Stir up thy strength and come and save us. 
Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou angry anger against thy, the prayers of thy people? How long will you anger against the prayers of your people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and givest them tears to drink in great measure. Verse 6, Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Verse 7, Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Verse number 8, Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest a, a room before it, and didst cause it to take deep root, and it filled the land. Verse ten: The hills were covered with the shadows of it, and they brought and the bow of their of uh, the bows of thereof were like the godly cedars or goodly cedars. Verse eleven. She sent out her, uh, her bows unto the sea, and her branches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her, her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way to pluck, to pluck her? The boar out of the wood, the boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Verse 14. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold and visit this vine. The vine represents the person, but represents the nation. And the vineyard which thy right hand hath planted, and the branches that thou madest for thyself. It is burned with fire. It is cut down. They perish with the rebuke of thy countenance. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man, whom thou madest strong for thyself. So will not we go back from thee? Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Verse 19, turn us again, O Lord God of hosts, cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Powerful, powerful scriptures. Let's look at verses 1 and 2 and begin with our points here. The appeal to God as your shepherd, the shepherd of his people. Here we see in verses 1 and 2 that he says, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. That's talking about the leaders of Israel or talking about the pastor. Thou hast leadest Joseph like a flock. Thou that dwellest between the cherubim shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh stir up thy strength and come and save us. The coming Messiah will speak in parables and will reveal the formerly hidden. This is addressing God as a shepherd of Israel. The psalmist called on God to listen attentively to his prayer. The image of God as shepherd is a tender and precious and precious one to his people. It emphasizes our total dependence on God as well as our foolish tendency to stray from him. Asaph has now appealed to God on this basis, reminding God how desperately his sheep need his guidance and help. We need God more than anything else, and we constantly need to be reminded. As the preacher, as the pastor, that is our job, is to remind the people that they need God every day, that we need God. That's our responsibility as Christians, is to let others to know that they need God. Why? because he leads and cares for his people like a flock. The psalmist gave God praise because he had always led his people like a shepherd leads his flock. Even when they turned away from him, 
Asaph's previous psalm, he noted that God had led his rebellious people like a flock of sheep in the wilderness. Here he calls on God to guide them through their crisis just as he did then. Even when he was forced to judge them, the people for their unfaithfulness, God faithfully, my friends, cared for his dear people. God took care of his people. Asaph addressed God as thou that leadest Joseph. Joseph may represent the entire northern kingdom as his descendants were a part of this fraction or group that had split off from the southern tribes. The psalmist may have been asking God to deliver his descendants to faithful Joseph's sake, for, for faithful Joseph's sake. Number two, because, he says, you need God's presence. You need, we need God's presence. Asaph also praised God for his presence among his people. The cherubims referred to are the angels whose wings covered the Ark of the Covenant, where God's presence dwelled in a very special way. Just as God's glory had shown when his presence filled the tabernacle, and then later the temple, the psalmist prayed for the glory of God's presence to shine on Israel, to shine and make itself known. Exodus chapter 40, verse 35 says, and Moses was not able to enter into the tent of the congregation because the cloud abode thereon and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Asaph then asked God to stir up his mighty power and to save his oppressed people. Verse 2, before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength and come and save us. I want you to notice the mention of Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh. The tribe of Ephraim and Manasseh, Joseph's sons, were part of the northern kingdom. And as stated above, the tribe of Judah and Benjamin made up the southern kingdom. By mentioning Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh together, the psalmist was undoubtedly praying that God would deliver the northern kingdom before all of Israel, both kingdoms. He may have been requesting for the crisis to reunite the Lord's chosen nations. The mention of these specific tribes had represented of the two kingdoms is significant because Joseph and Benjamin were Rachel's, Rachel's two sons. I want you to note that Asaph mentioned Benjamin between Ephraim and Manasseh and the, an unusual arrangement under the circumstances of the divided kingdoms. Asaph request appears to be for the family to come back together. He may have even uh, been praying that the southern tribes would rise to their brother Joseph's defense, that God would save Israel, the northern kingdom, by showing his mighty power through Judah and the southern kingdom. I was thinking about this last week as the Congress came together. You have the Democrats and the Republicans. And how that you had 212 Democrats that just stuck together, never ever separate. They just stuck right together. On the other side, you had the uh, you had the Republicans, and you had you had 20 holdouts. These 20 holdouts were the ones who were interesting, interested in changing and getting the rules where they would be back where they're supposed to be. They stood their ground. They voted. 14 times, and then the 15th time is when they chose uh, the Speaker of the House. You see, people need to come together. It was interesting that even through all of this that took place in Congress, actually, they've never come together. I'm hoping that they will. Assyria, captured of the Northern Kingdom, was God's discipline upon them for their unfaithfulness. Praise God that 
He is a faithful shepherd. He does not just let us, his sheep, go when we stray from him. He leads us along the path of righteousness. And when we wander from that path, he pulls us back to him with his staff, a symbol of his correction in Psalm 23, verses 2 to 4. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. What a comfort to know that God will bring us back to him even when we turn away. You know, God is always there for us to get us back. The image of God as our shepherd finds its ultimate fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the good shepherd who gave his life for his sheep. One of the most touching stories in scripture is Jesus' parable of the lost sheep found in Luke chapter 15, verses 4 to 6. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? Verse 5. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and his neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Jesus describes a shepherd who had 100 sheep going after one lone sheep that was lost. When he found it, he carried it safely home on his shoulders and rejoiced. The shepherd of whom Jesus spoke was himself. He will not allow one of his sheep to be lost. When we, his beloved sheep, for whom he died, stray from him, he will do whatever necessary. He, must, he wants to bring us back to the fold. We are secure as believers, not because we are faithful, because we're not. We are secure because of our shepherd is faithful, because Christ is faithful. He loves us so much that he will find us and bring us back to him and, and discipline us to teach us not to stray. Truly, he is the great shepherd of the sheep, Hebrews chapter 13, 20. What man of you Having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and, and go out and find it. And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost." God loves us. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John chapter 10 verse 11. For ye were as sheep going astray, but are now returned unto the shepherd and bishop of your souls. 1 Peter chapter 2 verse 25. He shall feed his flock, his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arms and carry them in his bosom and he shall gently lead those that are with their young. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 11. As a shepherd seeking out his flock in the day that he is among his sheep that are scattered, so will I seek out my sheep and will deliver them out of all places where they have been scattered in the cloudy and in dark days. Ezekiel chapter 34, verse 12. Number two, looking at verses three to six, I want you to notice, turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou anger against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them 
with the bread of tears, and giveth them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbor, and our enemies a laugh among themselves. Here we see God as as ask God, we are to ask God to turn turn the people back to him. We are asked God to turn us back to him. Asaph interceded in behalf of Israel's rebellion. God's painful discipline had, had brought his sinful people to their knees. Now God's servants asked God to turn them back to him that he might once again view them with favor and deliver them from their sufferings. I believe we're kind of like in that stage here now in the world. God is, God is bringing people to their knees. We're seeing, we're seeing it in weather. We're seeing all kinds of things happen. That God is trying to make himself known and get the believers, the people that, that he loves, the people that have been saved, back to him because they need to get ready for his coming. Why? Because you need his face to shine on you and to accept and save you, verse number three. The psalmist asked God to cause his face to shine on Israel. This request is repeated two other times in Psalm 7 and Psalm and verse number 7 here in verse number 19. Cause thy face to shine echoes the ancient blessing that Aaron pronounced over God's people in number 625. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. It is a request from God's favor, blessing, and help. Asaph understood the importance of spiritual truth. Before God could shine his favor on Israel, they had to repent. Accordingly, he first asked God to turn us again to revive his people so they would return to him. More than anything else, Israel needed to be restored spiritually. When they returned God, God would accept them and save them from their enemies. They needed to return and God would protect them. Number two, because his hand of discipline had fallen on you due to your sin and your selfish, insincere prayers. James 4, verses 1 to 3 says, From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lust, that war in your members? Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may be consumed it upon your lust. My friends, it's so clear in Scripture. Asaph acknowledged that the Assyrian captivity was God's hand of discipline on the wayward people. Just like what we're seeing happen today and the many different things that's going on, it's God's discipline of the people. Because of their atrocities and sin and selfish, insincere prayers. Think about homosexuality. Think about wokeism. Think about all the things that's taking place. God is going to judge America for all of this. This is a turning away from everything that God stands for. Israel had ignited God's wrath. Anger against the prayers of thy people. They also mean that because of his anger toward them, God would not hear his people's cries for help. Maybe because of what's happening, God's holding back. The word angry or ashan is the word used of the smoke that rises from a smoldering fire. It pictures God's continual fury toward his unfaithful people. Asaph asked how long the fire of wrath toward Israel would continue to run. How long will this fire go on? against Israel. Because of God's painful discipline, the people of Israel wept continually. Verse number five. God allowed his disobedient people 
to suffer the consequences of their sinful desires and selfish prayers. The language Asaph used to describe their grief looks back on God's provision for Israel in their wilderness and in their wanderings. Then he fed them with manna and gave them water to drink even when they provoked him to anger. Psalm 78, verses 15 and 24. Now an abundance of tears was their food and drink. God disciplined his unfaithful people by allowing them to suffer oppression at the hand of their enemies. They humiliated defeat. Their humiliated defeat gave their neighbors and the enemy nations that had joined the land of Israel reason to mock. The things that we do in America uh, gives other nations the opportunity and chance to mock us and make fun of us. As Israel's adversaries laughed among themselves, their ridicule multiplied and an excruciating shame of God's rebellious people. We see by the things that take place in our country, other nations look at us and think we're crazy. People think that Biden is nuts. Revival begins with repentance. Any sincere prayer for revival will begin with a call for repentance. Accordingly, Asaph prayed for God to turn Israel back to him again and again in scripture. Turn back or return to God is directly connected to turning away from sin. Get away from your sin and come back to God. Isaiah 59, 20, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression and Jacob saith the Lord. First Kings chapter 8, 33, when thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee and confess thy name and pray and make supplication unto thee into thy house. True revival will never come until we are willing to give up our sin. Nor will it come to a church until most are ready to turn away from their sin. God only restores our fellowship our fellowship with him when we are generally repent, when we generally say, I, I repent, I'm sorry. Until then, as individual believers, we will continue to live under, under, I'm sorry, under his painful discipline. And churches will continue to be powerless. If we continue in sin, we'll continue to be powerless. Not only that, but like disgraced Israel, we will also continue to be scorned and ridiculed by the world. We are at that place now where most of the world looks at us. The only thing they want out of America is money. That's all they want. They don't want anything else. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen and repent and do the first work, or else I will come unto thee quickly and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Revelation chapter 2, verse number 5. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Revelation chapter 3, verse 19. When thy people Israel be smitten down before the enemy because they have sinned against thee and shall turn again to thee, and confess thy name and pray and make supplication of thee into thy house. First Kings chapter 8, verse 33. If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and will heal their land. Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse number 14. The third thing we bring out here is found in verses 7 to 16. Beg God to restore you. Make his face to shine on and save you, lest ye be condemned. 
This is seen in the example of Israel. For the second time, the Osama spoke for the oppressed people of Israel, begging God to restore them to fellowship with him. He asked God, in verse 3, he asked God to make his face shine on them and save them from the shame of their repeated failures. His condemnation had brought them low. Their only hope was for God to revive them. Just like our only hope as a nation is for us to turn to God. God brought Israel out of Egypt as if she were uh, a tender vine in verses 8 to 11. Look with me there, verses 8 to 11. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt. Thou hast cast out the heathen and planted it. Thou preparest room before it and didst cause it to take deep root and fill the land. Verse 10. The hills were covered with the shadow of it and the bows thereof were like goodly cedars. She sent out her bows unto the sea and her branches unto the river. God brought Israel out of Egypt as if she were a tender vine. The psalmist appealed to God on the basis of his special love for Israel and all that he had done for that nation. God had brought Israel out of Egypt as though she were a vine. He had purchased a vine that was would serve for very distinct purpose. I think about America. America came out of Great Britain. It was caught up in the Anglican Church, and it was people didn't have the freedom of religion. It came. God brought it here, and gave it, opened the doors for it. It was not easy, but God blessed America. The image of Israel as God's vine, was first used by Jacob and as a prominent image in the Old Testament. As Jacob blessed his son shortly before he died, he declared that Joseph would be a fruitful bow or vine with extensive branches. Generations later, the prophets frequently described Israel as God's vine. The Lord gave Israel the richest region on earth to grow and bear fruit for him. He drove the heathen nations out of the promised land and planted his vine there. He prepared room before it, clearing the ground so that it could take deep root and grow. Then he blessed the vine so it filled the land. The land in verse 9. It grew so great that its shadows or shade, a symbol of its prosperity, covered the mountains and its branches towered over the mighty cedar trees in verse 10. Notice how the psalmist went to the extremes to convey the extent of God's blessings on Israel. To the ancient Hebrews, the mountains surrounded Israel and the cedars of Lebanon were the most celebrated examples of God's majestic creation. Imagine a grapevine so huge that it shaded the highest mountains in the land. Imagine its branches overreached the cedars of Lebanon, which were said to be 150 feet tall. This was how profusely God had blessed Israel, along with its soaring image. Asaph described the breadth of God's blessings, telling how he expanded Israel's territory. The mountains and the cedars represented Israel's southern and northern boundaries. God grew her branches out to the sea and to the river, westward to the Mediterranean, and eastward to the Euphrates. Number two, God executed judgment on Israel, that's the vine, because of her sin, verses 12 to 13. In spite of God repeating a warning through the prophets, Israel persisted in disobedience to the Lord. Therefore, God executed judgment on his people, the vine, because of their sin. Hedges or walls around a vineyard protected it from thieves and destructive animals, but God broke down his vineyard's walls, allowing its fruit to be stolen by the intruders. Likewise, he permitted wild beasts to ravage and take over the vineyard, verse 13. 
The symbolism of these images is clear. God had removed his divine protection from Israel due to her ongoing sin. I am fearful that is what is happening in America. As a result, a Syrian invaded the country and stole those things that God had used to bless his special people. Like wild beasts, the enemy nations ravaged the land and overtook Israel. We may think we're pretty strong and we're better than everybody else, but let me tell you something. God can do something with another nation and that nation can come in and steal away everything that we have. I want you to think about that. We're letting all these people come into this country. Letting all these different people from all of these nations come in. These people are coming in with their own philosophy, theology, their own ideas, and they're coming in by the droves. Something like almost five million have come in altogether in the last two years. Imagine what that's doing to the population. Imagine what influence that's bringing on the cities. That's like one large town. That's like almost the size of New York and people all together coming in. The people needed God to return to them at once to watch over and take care of them. You see, we need God. We need revival. We need to have a spiritual awakening in this country. Having been plundered and captured by the enemy, Israel's situation was desperate. The people needed God immediately. They needed his help immediately. The psalmist pleaded with God to return to his vine, to look down from heaven and to observe how his people were suffering. And he humbly asked God to visit them and to watch over and take care of them once again. People are praying all around our country, around the world, that we will have revival and that we have a spiritual awakening, not only in America, but around the world. Asaph reminded God of his special relationship with the people of Israel, his beloved vineyard. I was thinking the other day, all that's taking place in the Ukraine, the people are suffering and struggling. That could come to America. We're not, we, we're not away from that, folks. It can come here. He planted them with his right hand, a symbol of his favor and power. Who would ever think in January 6th of uh, the insurrection, uh, over a million people made their way into D.C.? Who would ever think? Who would ever think that we'd see a similar thing in Brazil? He had raised up from among them a strong branch or a son for himself. Above all the people of the earth, they were God's unique treasure. We are God's unique treasure. Now his rebuke, our discipline was destroyed in verse 16. His vineyard had been burned and cut down. Israel's experience serves as an example for us today. God raised up Israel and abundantly blesses the people so they could bear fruit for him as well as worship and glorify his name. Similarly, we have redeemed and greatly best so that we can worship the Lord and bear fruit for him. Like Israel before us, we will be judged by God when we turn to sin and live in disobedience to him. God is going to judge us. 1 Corinthians 6.20, For we are bought with the price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which are God's. John 15.8, Herein, my Father, glorify that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. The image of the vine is continued in the New Testament with Jesus as the vine and the believers as branches of the vine. Jesus taught clearly that the Father will judge all who do not bear fruit of him. John 15, 6. God paid the ultimate price for us the blood of his own son, 1 Peter chapter 1, 18 and 19. He has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in Christ. Why? So that we will strive to live holy lives before him. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. We have a sacred responsibility to fulfill the purpose for which God redeemed us. When we turn to sin, 
and disobedience, we cease to glorify God's name and to worship him effectively. At this moment, as soon as the Holy Spirit convicts us, we need to repent and beg God to restore us. Lest like Israel, we suffer the painful discipline of God. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can we except ye abide in me. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. John chapter 15, verses 1 to 6. It is our responsibility to get right with God. It's our responsibility to repent of our sin. It's our responsibility to reach out and win others to Christ. We can't win others to Christ if we can't win ourselves. How can we reach the world if we ourselves are lost? Who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness, by whose stripes ye were healed. First Peter chapter 2, verse 24. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation, and uphold me with thy free spirit. Wilt thou not revive us again? Wilt thou not revive us again, that my people may rejoice in thee? Psalm 85, 6. And then verses 17 and 19, we need to ask God to revive us through the Savior, the divinic kingdom, a picture of Christ. Draw a, to a close with a third plea of God to revive disobedient people of Israel. That's what Psalm 80 does. The psalmist asked God to place his hand a blessing on the man of thy right hand. Verse 17. Let thy hand be upon the man of thy right hand, upon the son of man, who thou made a strong for thyself. Who, to whom does this refer? Some commentators say it refers to Benjamin, which means son of the right hand. Others think it speaks of Israel. God's firstborn right-hand man among humanity. Israel was identified with God's right hand earlier in the Psalms in Psalm 15. Still others believe it points to Israel's king. However, further identification of the man of the right hand as the son of man points prophetically to the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Famous British preacher Charles Spurgeon wrote, There is no doubt here an outlook to the Messiah for whom believing Jews had learned to look as the Savior in time of trouble. This striking expression, applying in the fullest and most perfect sense of Christ, repeatedly, my friends, in Scripture, God's Son is said to be at, the, at God's right hand. The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies thy footstool. Psalm 110.1 But to which the angel said, He at any time sit on the, my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Hebrews chapter 1 verse 13 In the Bible, Jesus is often referred to as the Son of Man. Spurgeon noted that it is one of Christ's most definitive titles given to him in Scripture no less than 71 times. This is the title by which Jesus most often referred to himself in the Old Testament. Daniel called Christ by this name as well. I saw in the night vision, 
And behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days. And they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Daniel chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. My friends, this is what it's all about is to turn to Jesus, to let Jesus be the Lord of your life. When God's people need revival, we need revival now. That's what we need. We need revival now. Not tomorrow, not the next day, now. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord, that I will raise unto David a righteous branch, and a king shall reign and prosper, and shall execute justice and judgment in the earth. In his day Judah shall be saved, Israel shall dwell safely, and this is his name whereby he shall be called the Lord of our righteousness. The Lord our righteousness, Jeremiah chapter 23, verses 5 and 6. My friends, listen to me tonight. God loves you. God wants you to have revival. Do you want revival? Don't you want to have revival in your home, revival with your family, revival in America, revival around? Don't you want to see people turn back to God? Don't you, if you're not close to him, want to turn to him? He loves you. He sent his son to die on the cross for you. He loves you so much. And we get away so easy. We fall into these little pits and we have a hard time getting out. Some of them are so deep we have to dig our way out. But God is there to lift us out. All we have to do is look up. Look and live. Look and live. That's what Jesus says. Look and live. My friends tonight, how about you? Would you begin to pray for revival in our land? America needs revival. All of the politicians and people that are trying to come up with solutions, God has the solution strictly by believing and trusting in him. He'll take care of the rest. If this nation will fall on its knees before God and seek his face, if this nation will repent of its sin and turn to Jesus Christ, God will bless this land. But we need to turn. We need to turn now, not tomorrow, now. Friends, would you just turn to Jesus? Father, help us tonight that we can see that thou art the answer. Oh, there's many other things out there that people say will help, but I believe with all my heart through the word of God, the only thing that's gonna help us now and, ha and should have been a long time ago is Jesus. See, people are getting further and further away. Wokeism and homosexuality and transgender and all this other stuff that's taking place in our land. It is destroying everything that you are. God, help us as a nation. Help us to turn to you. Dear God, I pray we will have a spiritual awakening right here. It start with me and push out through the Voice of Victory podcast all around the world. Oh, God, help us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's message. I've gone a little long tonight, but I hope it was a blessing to you. Revival, that's what we need. We need revival. When God's people need revival, Psalm 80, we need it now. Thank you for tuning in tonight. Thank you for listening. This is Dr. Dave Smeltz of the Voice of Victory podcast. Until Wednesday night, God bless you. Keep a smile on your face, a song in your heart, and go and tell someone about Jesus today, for he loves you. God bless you, and amen.